Need help with love, sex, dating, or relationship issues? Help from Frank Kermit, the best-selling author and Canada's most international relationship coach, is only a click away at franktalks.com. You're listening to the home of cool, irreverent, and entertaining talk right here on L.A. Talk Radio. You're listening to The Art of Love with your host, Lucia, right here on L.A. Talk Radio. Hello and welcome to The Art of Love. My name is Lucia. I'm your host and a dating and relationship expert. And I'm here to entertain, educate, and enlighten you about love, dating, and relationships. Take your live calls, answer your emails, and speak to authors of books, which I find interesting. And today we have an old friend of the show. He's starting to become a regular... We have Frank Kermit, who's been on three times before, I believe. I've lost count, and um, so today should be the fourth time. And um, his CD, it's not a book this time, is From Friends to Lovers, Stop Being Her Emotional Cookie Man. So we are going to help guys get out of the friend zone. However, um, in conjunction with that, we're going to talk about an article I wrote called uh, "Reasons, uh, 12 Reasons Why Women Can't Stand Nice Guys. <laughs> And uh, will help guys to become nice guys with an edge. So you don't have to be a bad boy, and you don't have to be, as Frank would call you, the emotional cookie man. That's a great uh, name. So welcome back to the show, Frank. Thank you very much, Lucia. It's great to be here. All right. And you know what? I totally forgot to write a bio for you this time. So you want to just tell um, people a little bit about who you are, what you do? Sure. My name is Frank uh, Kermit. I am an author of books and many CDs, a best-selling author on Lulu.com. I teach men, women, couples, and everyone in between about their emotional needs for all kinds of relationship structures, whether it be monogamous relationship structures or non-monogamous relationship structures. Perfect. So I listened to your CD, found it very interesting, and you have to tell me the story that you said you were able to turn an enemy into a lover. Pretty much. That was uh, one of the uh, major points of what I call my development of going from a loser to a seducer. And uh, this girl was someone who we were friends and we became enemies because at the time, and I didn't realize this at the time, she was interested in me. I didn't return her affections. And she became an enemy of mine in a political field in my career. And then a major uh, crisis happened at the place where she had helped tarnish my reputation, where she was put on the chopping block. And because of my experience with the organization, and a number of people asked that I be brought back to this uh, organization to help uh, fix this crisis, because Mm -hmm. I had uh, enough knowledge of the organization, and I'd gone through these type of crises before. Now, in that process, I had to help her out of a jam. Ah. So I did so, I basically became her hero uh, in that moment, and through that, I inadvertently addressed a number of her emotional needs. The fact is, I didn't abandon her when I could have, Um, I stepped in, I I protected her reputation, I I, I basically made everything all right. And we ended up uh, hooking up afterwards. Wow. So that was turning a an enemy into a lover. And it's the same process as turning a friend into a lover. Yeah. The exact same process. Okay, yeah, we're going to get to that. So now you now there's categories. Women put guys into different categories and apparently guys only have two categories. So talk about the women's categories first. Okay. Women are on the receiving end of sexual attention. They get a lot of sexual attention from men, sometimes from other women. 
when you're on the receiving end of all this attention, you, you start realizing you get to be picky about who you're going to accept the attention from and whether or not you even want that attention. Mm-hmm. So somebody who's getting very little sexual attention, it can't be too picky. They've got to take what they can get. Men are on the projecting end of sexual attention. They have to pursue. They have to go get what they want. Very few men are on the receiving end of sexual attention. One of the things I'm learning through my practice is that those men who do have uh, are on the receiving end of lots of sexual attention mm-hmm. usually are very uncalibrated people because they never had to go without the sexual attention, so they never had to modify their behavior in order to connect with other human beings. When a woman is receiving so much sexual attention, she can decide who she wants to have a sexual fling with. She can decide who she wants just as a friend. And this is where a lot of guys end up in that category. So she has categories of the short-term lover, categories of the long-term lover, categories of the nice guy who would be a good provider, but she's not ready to settle down now. So she, that guy's in that category of, well, maybe someday. And then she has the category of, Lots of really nice guys that really, really like her, but she's not that into. So she'll keep them around as a good friend. There's also that category for her of those guys who are really creepy, giving her sexual attention, but being so uncalibrated, they creep her out. They don't make her feel safe. So it's not a very, it's not just, you know, a yin and a yang. It's not just a either A or B. There's a variety of categories for women because they're on the receiving end of sexual attention. Right, and then what are the guys' categories? Basically, the guys' categories are, well, I either will have sex with her or I won't. Right. And that's where it starts. Now, one of the things I teach guys is to also develop a sense of categories because guys will get themselves into trouble. They'll end up having sex with somebody they probably shouldn't have. Mm-hmm. You that's know, true. and this is where guys need to develop a little bit more and say, okay, I, I need more categories for people so I can calibrate my behavior better. And for women, chances are that if they're being too picky and they have all these categories, it's getting in their own way. And they need to be a little bit more flexible in terms of their categories. Yeah, in fact, you said that friendship doesn't stop a man from having sex. So if that's true, then should women who are in a committed relationship even allow their guys to have female friends? Well, here it is. It depends on whether or not the guy has an understanding of what commitment and monogamy means to him, assuming they're in a monogamous relationship. Mm -hmm. And sex for a man is an emotional need. So should a man be allowed to have female friends when he's in a committed relationship? It really, the, the question is, are those female friendships a threat to that relationship? And in some cases, they will be, mm-hmm. because the guy doesn't have the, the common sense to say, well, look, if I promise to be committed, that means I shouldn't be having sex or pursuing sex with these other women. And other times, it will not be, because the friendships with the women are not a threat to the relationship, because the guy has certain beliefs about how he's going to conduct himself, not because of who he's with, but because of who he is. Right, so it's the woman's job to figure out who the heck she's with and whether he can be a monogamous or not. Exactly. She has to be a judge of character in that point. Okay. All right, so let's move on to my list of why women prefer bad boys. And so, um, you know, I haven't really talked about this. Uh, I wrote this article for uh, Your Tango. Actually, I called it, as I said earlier, 12 Reasons Women Can't Stand Nice Guys. We're not going to do all 12 today. And it received a huge response because it went viral. So far, it's had almost 7,000 Facebook shares, which is a lot. And uh, a lot of comments, and a lot of guys are not too happy with me. So I had Frank look at it and get uh, give me his take on it. So why do you think so many guys were not very happy with me? One of the ways that the article was written, it almost makes it sound like nice guys have very little value in the lives of the women that they like. And that's not true. Nice guys do have a value. They may not necessarily come across as attractive, but they have some sort of a value. The other thing is I think people read the article and they interpreted it as, well, then I should just be a jerk. I should just be a bad boy. Mm -hmm. And just because some women will respond to jerk-like behaviors doesn't mean that every guy out there needs to turn into a jerk because we cannot justify 
the the behavior of some women who respond to bad behavior as saying, well, this is the way it should be for everybody. But I get what you were saying in the article, mm-hmm. and I agree with a number of the sentiments. I think, though, that people didn't interpret the information you provided in the way that you had meant it. Right. I was trying to help them. I'm like, listen, you know, maybe if you can adopt a few of these into your uh, repertoire, then you might be able to get out of the uh, nice guy category that women don't want to have anything to do with, because obviously the majority of women, in a way, do prefer bad boys, because everyone has a bad boy story. Everyone is always complaining that uh, they're dating a bad boy. Well, uh, one of the things that I teach is that there's a difference between what people like and what people respond to. That's true. So let's let's be clear here, because I think a lot of the controversy that came up with the article is on the semantics, the, the terminology being used. Do people like being mistreated? No. no. I have to say no. <laughs> but some people respond to mistreating behaviors. Mm-hmm. The same way that, you know, if you've ever ended up in a situation where you said, why did I allow myself to be suckered into this? Well, chances are that there were some behaviors at work that you respond to even though you may not like them. And this is what we need to look at. I think there's a large number of women that will respond to bad boy behaviors. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean they necessarily like the bad boy. It doesn't mean they think the bad boy is a great human being. But they may respond to some of these behaviors. But just because they respond to those behaviors doesn't mean that you go out there and you you don't act violent, you don't act like a jerk. But let's look at the principles behind those behaviors. And if we can emulate those principles behind the behaviors, that is attractive. Right. That's that's what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, because, you know, I always say, I mean, the perfect guy, uh, the guy that women want is kind of a combination of the two. So the nice guy with the edge. However, most guys aren't able to be that way unless, of course, they've studied with you. And so they either fall into the bad boy category or the nice guys. And so in having to choose between the lesser of the two evils, because the bad boy seems to be the alpha male, women more often than not are going to go for the bad boy. Exactly. And this is the dilemma. The idea here is that women are looking for a certain set of behaviors that they are attracted to. And their choices are, I can be with the guy that I know is bad for me, but he evokes the behaviors that I respond to. Or I can be with the guy that, yes, I I know he's great for me, I know he's a wonderful human being, but he doesn't evoke any sort of response on my part with his behavior patterns. They will often opt to date the bad boy that they know is not good for them because that's what she responds to. Right. Okay. So let's go over some of these. So I said that uh, nice guys, are they're too nice and no one can really be that nice unless they're, you know, faking it or they're, be, you know, they're a saint and there's not that many saints walking around. And so they're so busy being nice instead of being real. And women instinctively, instinctively don't trust that, you know, whereas bad boys, they keep it real. But nice guys, they don't want to upset the, the women. OK, let's look at that. When you say that nice guys are not real, most nice guys do think that it is possible to be nice all the time because that's how they interpret their own behaviors. So a nice guy is going to say, I don't understand why everybody doesn't want to date me. I'm a nice guy, and nice guys are good, and I'm nice all the time. They don't get that. People will interpret their behaviors differently than they interpret their own behaviors. The other thing is, when we're talking about bad boys, there's two categories here. So let's see if we can do Let's get very specific. Okay. There's the bad boy stereotype of the abuser. Well, we're not this talking is about the, that. This is the violent type of jerk. So whenever we start talking about the bad boy, it can conjure up certain images of the stereotypical abuser of women. Nobody wants to emulate that or become that. At least I hope not. And then there's the guy that is considered the jerk, where there are times that he acts like a jerk. He might not actually be a jerk, but he has jerk-like behaviors. So let's make the distinction here. No, at no time in your article that I see you saying that a guy should become an abuser. Absolutely. All right? Now, that's my interpretation, but that's also because I know you. We've worked together in the past. And other people who read your article might be saying, oh, so I should not be nice ever, and I should just go ahead and be one of those abusive bad boys, which is not what you were saying. No, absolutely. But some people might interpret it that way. Right. Well, we can't reach everybody. Now, inter- Go ahead. No, go ahead. 
Okay, now when we talk about not being real, the biggest difference between the jerk, not the abuser, because we're not going to be even talking about that, mm-hmm. the biggest difference between the jerk and the nice guy is that women are more likely to trust a jerk because a jerk is not going to care whether or not she is unhappy that he's being completely honest with her. The nice guy, however, has a reputation of always holding back and not saying things because he doesn't want to upset her. It's not because the nice guy is not trustworthy, which I think is, again, an interpretation of some of your readers who took that out of your article. Mm -hmm. It's because a nice guy legitimately doesn't want to hurt a girl. He doesn't want to hurt her feelings. So he might not be completely blunt, honest with her, even if what she's asking for is the absolute truth. However, a jerk doesn't care whether or not she's upset with him. Mm-hmm. He's, his main thing is, I'm going to tell you exactly what I think, whether or not you like it. Okay. In that way, jerks are more real than nice guys. But it isn't because the nice guy's not trustworthy. It's because his priority is, I don't want to hurt the girl. I want to make her happy. But that's not how a woman is going to interpret it. It's the nice guy who says, no, honey, you don't look fat in that dress. You look fine. I think you're beautiful. And he may very well mean it. But when a woman says, do I look fat in this dress? What she's really saying is, hey, I'm going about to go out in public here. Do I look bad? Is my reputation going to be sullied for me look dress this way going out. It is the jerk who says, actually, honey, you do look fat in that dress. Now, at the moment, she may feel hurt. She may be upset. But the jerk is willing to be honest with her because he's not worried about upsetting her. His attitude is, I'm going to be honest with you whether you like it or not. It is the nice guy who has now developed the reputation of, well, I don't want to hurt her. and I really do think she's beautiful. So I'll just tell her, yes, honey, you really look too good. You really, really do look good in that dress. Right, and we don't want that. Right. We want the truth most of the time, not all the exactly. time. Exactly, and it's, it's the best of intentions with the worst outcome. Okay, let's move on to the next one. So I said respect. No one respects a doormat. Nice guys don't set boundaries or make any real demands. A bad boy doesn't let a woman walk all over him or control him. Women can't respect a man they can control. No respect equals no attraction. I would agree with this. One of the tenets that I teach is that it's more important to be respected than it is to be liked. One of the things about a nice guy is that a nice guy wants people to like them. So they'll end up agreeing to things that they're not really happy with. They'll end up doing extra chores that they shouldn't really be doing or want to do because they want people to like them. It is the jerk that says, I don't care whether or not you like me for this. I'm going for respect. Women respond to men who demand to be respected. They do not respond to a guy that wants to be liked. Now, I'm going to give you an example from my own life. Mm -hmm. I was uh, working on a project with a woman who is a professional dominatrix. This is a woman who is used to being with very submissive men, all of whom need to be liked. And for that reason, they allow themselves to be completely disrespected by her. Her and I were working on this project, and she ended up doing something that did not sit well with me. Uh, She ended up, we were supposed to meet up and do some sort of a presentation together, and she canceled it, but without telling me. Mm -hmm. And she canceled it, uh, let's say, 24 hours beforehand. I only found out through other means about an hour before the event. So I call her up and I say, what the hell is going on? She says, oh, well for this reason and that reason, and uh, I had to cancel the event. Sorry, I didn't call you. Now, this is absolutely ridiculous. I'm the person there who's helping to co-moderate this thing, and boom, I don't even get a phone call that says, hey, uh, this event's been canceled for these reasons, and I'm letting you know as soon as I could. That's just disrespectful. Mm -hmm. Now, what do most nice guys do in a situation like that? Okay. They might they might say, well, it's okay. Uh, I understand. Some of them might even get mad at first and say, well, why didn't you call me before? In my case, I, I said, well, well, when did you know that you were going to cancel this event? And when she gave me the reasons, well, I had reason this, reason that. Some of them are personal. I'm not going to get into it. But I can tell you that none of the reasons that she gave me justified not picking up the phone and calling me. Mm-hmm. 
And I told her as much. And I said, you're so used to dealing with very submissive men that you are in a repeating behavior pattern of treating guys like garbage and thinking that it's okay and getting away with it. I'm not a submissive man. I am not one of your subs. You will treat me with respect. Now, when you take this kind of tone with somebody, you're not going to be liked. Mm -hmm. People aren't going to like you when you stand up for yourself. Well, that's too bad, because I don't care about being liked. I demand to be respected. Okay. The nice guy is always focusing on, oh, I want to be liked, I want to be liked, because that's how the nice guy gets any form of attention. A person who's demanding to be respected is not going to be liked a lot, and chances are, depending on the context, he might lose a lot of favor with people because he demands to be respected. The benefit, however, is that women will respond to a man that demands to be respected. Yes, they will. Um, let's go back to the dominatrix thing for a second. <laughs> Why do uh, very powerful men feel the need to be dominated by a dominatrix? Um, that's in the minority of the cases. Most of the submissive males going to any dominatrix aren't exactly very powerful men. Oh. There, they, there are a minority of them. Mm -hmm. There are a minority where they're major heads of corporations, and then for a brief period of time, what they want is just to be relieved of the responsibility and just let somebody else take complete and utter control. Now, if a lot of the, if their particular interaction, when you're talking about a particular dominatrix and a particular submissive male, if their interaction involves the submissive male being punished or being made to feel guilty or being told about a horrible person they are, usually it's because that guy has some sort of inner work that he needs to do. Maybe he's got a very um, low self-esteem. Maybe in order to become a very powerful man in his career, he's had to do things that he's not very happy or proud of. Mm. And this is his way of finding some sense of atonement for himself. Oh, interesting. Okay. The, ma the majority of submissive men in the BDSM community actually are not these high-powered corporate executives. They're actually submissive men in a lot of their areas of their life, and they're looking for the love that they never got from a mommy figure. Or they grew up in an environment where mommy, where mommy's only love was very cold and abusive, and this is what they respond to. Got it. Okay. All right. So let's move on. I had to go off topic for a second there just to find out since I had you on the phone. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. So I said sperm wars. Women are designed to procreate with the strongest possible genes. Bad boys or jerks, as we're calling them, are sending an unconscious message that they have great genes, so they're not afraid of losing the woman by misbehaving. Nice guys are sending the message they don't ha think they have good genes, so they won't misbehave. Okay, I, I have a different interpretation of that. Okay. And it's the idea that when a woman is on that type of instinctual level looking for good genes, she's basically thinking, I need to choose the best genes so that my children that are carrying my genes as well are going to have the best possible chance of survival. Here's the kicker. When she finds a man attractive, she also assumes that other women will find him attractive. Mm -hmm. This is why if, let's say, you ask out a girl, uh, you're a guy, you ask out a girl, she says no. The best thing you can do is say, well, I understand, and then go out and date another woman and make sure that at some point the girl you asked out sees you on a date with another woman. That makes the first woman realize, wait a minute, that girl's interested in him? Maybe I was wrong. Maybe I should be interested in him too. And then that's how you end up dating both of them. When it comes to sperm wars, mm. the jerk, the one who's basically saying, I want to be respected and not liked. I'm going to go after what I want. And yeah, you might think I'm a jerk because I may be stepping on some toes and maybe I'm going to be a little too assertive at times. That's still the guy that women know that other women would be attracted to. Those traits will be carried on into her offspring that carry her genes as well, which means that she has a very good chance of having grandchildren which also carry her own genetic material. Got it. Okay. It's and not, okay, just, just to follow up, it's not just about, oh, I want a guy with really great genes. Mm -hmm. It's because I want a guy with great genes so he will attract a mate and every offspring thereof will also carry my generic material with him. Okay, so speaking of competition, would you agree with this statement? Um, um, let's see, what is the statement? Uh, oh, yeah, competition brings out the best in men and the worst in women. 
That's a very interesting statement. I got to think about that. <laughs> Meaning that if a woman is non-exclusive and she's dating several men, then the men will like step up and actually court her and try to win her over because they know there's competition. Whereas women, when they find out a guy is dating more than one woman, they, you know, they're ready to kill him. Oh, that uh, I, I wouldn't agree with that interpretation of it, because I've I've actually had the experience of just the opposite. Whenever a woman that I was dating knew that I was dating other women, as mm -hmm. long as I did it ethically and honestly, and I never hid it as some big secret, mm -hmm. uh, what would happen with me is that if I was dating two women, there would be a slight competition between the two women because it became a question of, well, who do you like more, me or her? Mm -hmm. Once I was dating three women at the same time, they stopped asking about the other girls that I was dating, and they focused on their relationship with me, trying to make it the best relationship possible. Mm -hmm. When I, I don't think that that you know uh, guys in competition are going to be better or, or more ethical than women in competition. I don't think that ethics are gender specific. No, it's not I about think, ethics. It's more about you know. Whereas a guy might take a if a woman for granted if he thinks that he's the only one dating her, but once he knows there's competition, then he might uh, step it up to win her over. Um, he might, or he might interpret it that as oh, you're seeing other guys while you're seeing me? Well, I can't really trust you then. Uh, it really depends on the dynamic. It, it, I'm talking if it's um, non-exclusive, if they don't have a commitment. If they don't have a commitment and it's non-exclusive, and she's dating other girls and she's dating other guys. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that the guy necessarily is going to step it up, and I don't necessarily think the women are going to step it up if if they have if they all have other options, I think that if we're talking about being emotionally healthy, they're going to focus on building that unique relationship as much as they can. Those guys who are focusing on their competition, quote unquote, are focusing on the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. And I would say let's say the same thing of the women. If you're focusing on the other person, the other people that your partner is dating, your focus is on the wrong thing. Your your goal needs to be that relationship. Right, right. Okay. Sorry for going off topic again. It's just, you, I know you have so much knowledge. So as these things come to mind, I have to like <laughs> ask you. Um, so on with the list, we're kind of bouncing around today. So fear of intimacy. If a woman is afraid of intimacy, she subconsciously knows she can avoid it with a bad boy since she can never get close enough to him to have to go there. A nice guy will eventually want a commitment and that's scary. I w agree 100% with that statement. With the understanding, however, and this is a major caveat. A lot of nice guys have what's called a savior complex. Mm. And the savior complex is, I only want to date women who are into jerks because I only will feel good and I'll only have her love forever if I can save her and be her hero and save her from herself. And what a lot of these nice guys don't understand is that that is the formation of their own fear of intimacy. Wanting someone who is emotionally damaged, such that they have a fear of intimacy, and always pursuing women who have a fear of intimacy is just as much of a fear of intimacy for the guy who's doing it. Wow. So whenever a guy tells me, you know, oh, she's such a great girl, she's such a nice girl, she's dating all these jerks and I'm madly in love with her, <laughs> my question to him is, Okay, so you both have a fear of intimacy. She's enacting her fear of intimacy by dating jerks. You're enacting your fear of intimacy by not dating anybody at all and waiting for her. Yeah, so it's a two-way street. It goes both ways. Just like, do you, exactly. do you think that a guy, let's say he's with someone and then she cheats, is, does that mean that he's attracted to women who cheat? Uh, no. What I do believe, however is that there might be other behavior patterns in there that, uh, that he might be responding to. So, for example, mm. I don't think that people are automatically attracted to people who cheat. But someone who cheats usually has a collection of behavior patterns. Sorry. Someone who cheats usually has a collection of behavior patterns in place that other people may respond to. So you're not responsible for the way another person behaves, mm -hmm. but you are responsible for how you react to it. Now, if you can learn something from it and move on to, and take those new lessons into your new relationship, that's a sign of growth. But if, you keep, if every relationship you get into 
and it turns out that you're dating somebody and every person you're dating happens to be a cheater and mm-hmm. there's a cheater and there's a cheater. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't say the person's attracted to a cheater. I would say that they're attracted to a collection of behavior patterns that cheaters tend to have. Wow. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Moving on. Uh, charm. Nice guys don't always know what to say and are sometimes at a loss for words. Bad boys can be very charming and know exactly what women want to hear. However, they eventually switch over to being selfish. By the time they reveal their true colors, the woman has fallen for them and has a hard time letting go. Okay, now this is something that I cover in my book on how to steal her away from a jerk. (laughs) Okay. Okay. One of the classic moves of a jerk, and this is actually a classic move of most emotional manipulators. Yes. Is that their initial impression that they project becomes the filter for everything else they do. That's why at the very beginning of an intimate relationship, they'll say exactly the right thing, Mm -hmm. they'll do exactly the right thing. So that way, when they start with their abusive behavior patterns, it gets interpreted by the initial filter that they have put in place. And everything is emotionally charged. Mm -hmm. So... Here's a, uh, let's come up with a concrete example here, okay. all right? Um, when the man is trying to charm a woman and he's an emotional manipulator, he will make her feel that she is so important to him, that she is so special, that she holds a place where she is his muse. <laughs> she has such a sense of affect on his life. Mm. So she feels, my goodness, this must be a sign of a special and deep connection and everything is emotionally charged. Mm-hmm. That becomes the filter. What happens, let's say, four months into it, he decides to pull an emotionally abusive behavior, which is to say, I really don't like the fact that you are spending all of this time with members of your family. And rather than have a legitimate excuse, for example, maybe a member of the family might be abusive, maybe the member of the family may be uh, an addict and is is taking advantage or, or hurting the girl, Um, It just may be a case of, well, I just don't want you to do that. And they don't have a legitimate excuse for saying, I'm going to isolate you from the people you love and who love you. Mm -hmm. It's going to be interpreted through the original filter of, you're so important to me. Our connection is so strong. Mm -hmm. That's why it's not seen as a jerk-like behavior. That's why it's not seen as an emotionally abusive behavior. Because it's being re-filtered. And then what happens when it starts getting, let's say, into the area of abuse and violence? Well, of course I hit you. Of course I beat you. I love you so much. I couldn't help myself. Look what you did to me. Look what you made me do. Mm. Because they go back to the original filter. Right. Okay. Um, Now, some bad boys have that real sense of charm and charisma. Yes. A nice guy tends not to be very calibrated. You know, one of the things about a nice guy is that a nice guy tends to act the way he acts with the girl, the same way he acts with everybody. But that's not being calibrated. A nice guy honestly does not evoke a sense that he has any real understanding of human social dynamics. Mm -hmm. To the point where the woman says, oh, God, I feel like his mother because I have to educate him every time we go out not to embarrass me. Mm Mm-hmm. A bad boy tends to have more social experience. They know how to behave in public. They know that there are things you say and don't say, and they will call people out on it, which, again, makes them a bit of a jerk. But how attractive. Right. You just reminded me. Yeah, I was dating this, you know, one nice guy, and, you know, his his eating manners were not up to par. (laughs) And it started to bother me because he would, like, uh, take a bite, and then he'd wipe his mouth after every bite, and I'd be, and uh, and then he was also eating like um, unconsciously, like he wouldn't, he would just like start eating and not look up and just go from dish to dish to drinking to dish to, di- and you know it was like oh you know w- w- I haven't eaten for a week and I'm so hungry. I mean not that he made noise or anything like that, but just he just became totally focused on the food and he couldn't look up and have a conversation. So I finally had to say something to him, but you know yeah like you said I mean I felt like his mother. And that's exactly what's going to turn a woman off. Whereas the bad boy, because he's, he's, a, he's a lot more socially savvy, 
he knows that, okay, you're not going out to dinner so you can have dinner. The dinner is just a formality. You're going out to dinner to figure out what role the other person can play in your life. Right. Exactly. Uh, mm-hmm. um, actually, so speaking of mothers, um, I also m- mentioned Mother Nature. and I, Actually, no, Fixer Upper. I said, nice guys don't usually need to be fixed. Bad boys usually usually do, so they become a project. Women think if they can create the perfect man, he'll never leave them. And also, if they're busy fixing someone else, they don't have to look at their own needs that need to be fixed in their own lives. I'm talking about the women's lives. I would agree with uh, with the last part of that statement, where a woman will, will want to focus on working on trying to change him and fix him, as opposed to fixing you know what's really wrong in her life. It's a great distraction. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of creative avoidance for whatever issues are going on there. And I happen to know from experience that when a woman finally feels that the project is completed, she doesn't end up wanting being, wanting to be with that guy. She moves on to the next project that she can work on. Because that's the kind of woman she is. She needs to be working on someone. Exactly, because it's, it's time away from working on herself. The other element going on here is that if a woman has decided prematurely and put that bad boy nice uh, guy into the category of her mind that this is the guy I'm going to marry. Mm-hmm. She will try to change him to fit the role that she has already projected onto him. Right. And guys do this as well. They pick that one girl and say, okay, that girl is the one that I'm going to marry. That girl is going to be the one for me. But that person doesn't even have the same values you do. Oh, I'll change that person to fit the role that I have superimposed on them. Mm -hmm. And this is very, very dangerous thinking. This is, there's there's an emotional dysfunction going on here. When you make somebody so important, that person now becomes a symbol. And trying to get a human being to live up to the symbol you created in your brain, not only is it not fair to that other person, but it's really, really emotionally damaging behavior. Yeah, to both of you. Exactly. Yeah, um, and, and actually, and you said something interesting in your um, CD. You said that there can only be one child at a time in their relationships. Why is that? Well, two children cannot ever be safe because they'll end up making some bad choices when they have the adult power. Inside every adult is an inner child. Mm -hmm. And when one person is behaving like an adult, the other person has the option of being, of of letting that inner child out, of actually being the inner child for a limited time. And as long as there is an adult figure uh, present, it means that there's somebody looking after the inner child that's being let out to play. Mm -hmm. But when you have two children that are out to play, That means that there's no parental supervision, that there's no adult in the area. But you're dealing with adults who have adult powers and adult responsibilities. So a woman will end up having to become the mother figure in the relationship, and the guy doesn't even see this as a problem. Because in a guy's mind, women fall in one of two categories. She's either his ally or she's his enemy. So if she's being a mother figure to him, he still sees her as an ally. He doesn't see her as an enemy not realizing that he's turning her off. Absolutely. Totally. Yeah, because also she she doesn't get to be the little girl if she has to take the lead. And, you know, sometimes we want to be little girls. Damn right. (laughs) One of the best things that a guy can do when he's taking a girl out on a date, especially if they're, they're really connecting and then they're really having a good time, take her out for an ice cream cone. You don't have to spend lots of money on her. Just tell her, I'm taking you to ice cream. You know, what was the type of ice cream that uh, you got as a kid? You know, was it a sundae? Was it an ice cream cone with a dip or whatever? And if she says it was a strawberry sundae, you get a small strawberry sundae. And if you really want to evoke the little girl in her, you feed her. You feed her spoon fly by spoon. <laughs> and I know it sounds silly, and it sounds like, oh, I can't believe it. I got news for you. The, the more, um, the higher up career-wise or the the more of an adult that this woman has to be in her life, especially if she's in charge of other people, Mm -hmm. the more she is going to melt Mm. when somebody caters to the little girl and her so much that he's actually feeding her that piece of cake. 
Oh. What about the, what, does it work the opposite way, where a guy has a lot of power, and so the girl um, caters to the little boy? Um, if he allows that to where she's catering to the little boy and him that much, she will likely lose attraction for him because she starts feeling like his mother. Yeah, that's true. The only time that it is okay for that to happen is, okay, there's situation number one, he may be physically incapable of it, um, you know, he, he might be in a position where he can't do it for himself, so she'll take care of him and do it for him. The other time that I've seen it happen where it might work in a relationship, but there's going to be some long-term relationship struggles with mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. and that is where the only reason she's doing it is because she's trying to find a way to make herself valuable to him. So she'll end up doing something for him that he should really be doing for himself. But she's doing it because, well, I like him so much, and I really want him to like me, so I, I, I'm going to... Uh, you know, I'm going to do things for him, even without him asking, because I'm trying to prove just how valuable I am to him. That I've always seen as a red flag, because it seems really nice at first. Mm -hmm. But at some point, she ends up developing expectations based on of that course. behavior. Absolutely. And we want to get paid back. Exactly. But he's not going to see that, because in his mind, well, if she's just choosing to do this, she's choosing to do this. She's an independent human being, and, if she's, and he's not getting that she's doing it because she wants something in return. And when that happens, it, the guy has to put a stop to it. There were women that I dated when I had my bachelor pad and I had my, my lifestyle at the time. They would do things without me asking, like wash my dishes or sweep my floors. One woman was trying to do my laundry. And I had to step in and say, no, you're not here for that. I would take the boom out of her hand. Go into the living room. This is not for you. You know, put down those dishes. You're not here to be my maid. You're, you're not my mother. Stop mothering me. Would with the you? one girl who was trying to do my laundry. I said, get the heck out of the laundry room. What are you doing? Get over here. Uh -huh. And you know, it's like, take them into another room. Do something sexual. Remind them that they're women and not here to be my mate or my, my mother or anything like that. I know. They, I, they I, were trying to do... Go ahead. I, I tell women, don't lift a finger until there's a ring on it. And even if there is a ring on it, it's not a question of, of lifting a finger or doing that. It's, it's that they were trying to do it because they were trying to put themselves in a position where they could have an unrealistic expectation on the relationship. And that isn't fair to both of them. But most guys don't see it that way. Most guys will see it as, oh, she's being courteous, she's being nice. Mm -hmm. He doesn't get that there's an expectation there. And getting back to the topic of nice guys, mm -hmm. when a guy is really nice to a girl, often he has the expectation of, if I'm nice to her, she'll end up liking me. And this is the unfair predicament that nice guys put women in. Mm -hmm. Because they say, well, I understand we're just friends, but I'm still going to be nice to you because I'm, I'm hoping you're going to change. I'm hoping you're going to decide that you want to go out with me. And that extra expectation is just as bad as when a woman is trying to do extra things to gain favor. Right. So then let's say a nice guy is in the friend zone where they usually end up. How can he mm -hmm. change that? Okay, the first thing he needs to do is that he has to put some space between him and the girl. If he really wants to attract this girl, and she's already decided that he's too nice for her, he needs to go out and date other women. He needs to demonstrate through experience that other women want to date you because they see you as a sexual being. That's the first thing. Mm -hmm. Number two, you're going to have to change the behaviors that caused her to categorize you as that nice guy emotional cookie man. There's some behaviors that you're exhibiting that you may not even be aware of. Mm -hmm. And if you don't change those specific behaviors, you're going to continue to be the nice guy, friend zone guy. Once you've made that significant change, you can reintroduce her back into your life. At that point, because you've changed so much, she has to recategorize you as a potentially new person, as if you are a brand new person, and it's in that window of opportunity that you have a chance of dating her. In most cases, though, and this is the big test, mm -hmm. so all of you nice guys listening to this, here is the super big test. When a girl tells you, let's just be friends, your best answer is to say, okay, who do you want to set me up with? Because that's what I expect of my friends. Mm. So if a girl says, we should just be friends, you tell her, I understand, tell you what, you tell me what you're looking for in a guy, I'll tell you what I'm looking for in a girl, and we'll set each other up on a blind date with one of our mutual friends. And, and then you'll really know how she feels about you. Exactly, because if she is willing to introduce you to one of her friends, now you know that, okay, she likes you, but she just doesn't see you guys as compatible. 
and she sets you up with other girls, then you know, okay, she at least sees me as an attractive male. She sees me as a sexual being, just not a compatible one for her. But if she turns around and says, no, uh, I don't have any female friends. Uh, no, I, I don't think you're the type of guy that any of my friends would want to date. Uh, no, all of my friends have boyfriends. There's nobody I could introduce you to. Bull. Absolute bull. It's because she does not find you attractive. She does not see you as a sexual being. That's when there's nothing there for you to stick around for. Mm. And when she calls you up at 3 o'clock in the morning because the guy that she's dating has just been really mean to her and she needs someone to listen to her, don't answer the phone and say, of course, I'll be here for you all the time. You can go ahead and tell me all of your problems, and I will just sit here and wait for you to realize that I am the better man for you. Mm. Does not work. Uh, That's where you got to say, stop, I'm not your therapist. When you're with me, we have fun. Let's go do something fun. And you actually take her out on a date and do something fun. And every time she tries to bring up her problems, or tries, no, I'm not your therapist. Let's have fun. That is expressing being assertive. That's the dominance. That's saying, she, she, you know, you said predictability. A guy who's saying, I'm not going to be your therapist. We're going to do something fun. I'm not going to tell you what it is until we get there. Boom, you're starting to address all of those emotional needs so that she doesn't see you as just a friend. But is there ever a point of no return where you've been the, uh, the nice guy for so long that there, even if you do these things that you just mentioned, that she's still not going to be able to take your other friend zone? Um. Depending on her emotional needs at the time, I mean, it's possible, but very unlikely. The only reason that you became the nice guy is because somehow the behaviors that you exhibited were a turnoff to her. And even if you do something attractive later on, you're still going to be interpreted through that original filter mm -hmm. of the nice guy. So that's why you need the time away. You absolutely need the time away. You need the time so that she has to reprocess you when you come back into her life. Now, if, she, if you come back into her life and you're still exhibiting the same behavior patterns, mm -hmm. she'll always see you as that nice guy. Well, what about maybe if she put you, uh, made you a friend because she just wasn't attracted to, to the guy? and he, So he looks the same. He might be acting not like a nice guy anymore, but if he still looks the same, she can't get past that. Um, generally speaking, uh, women have an easier time getting past the looks because it's a, about an emotional response, mm -hmm. more so than men. Mm. And a woman who is so hell-bent on the way the guy looks, even if he's behaving in an attractive manner, usually there's some sense of emotional, um, emotional block. There's some sense of a fear of intimacy where, hey, perfect guy just came into the picture, but this one thing is wrong, so it's impossible for it to work. Uh, whether it's a man or a woman, when those type of criteria are getting in the way, usually there's a, there's, a, there's a deeper thing going on. People talk themselves out of the best relationships that they could have for reasons that have nothing to do with the other person. Interesting. And then finally, you said that you know, in order to know that someone has truly grown up, they, all, they have to go through a, a type of catharsis? Yeah, I call it the catharsis story. Um, when I'm working with a nice guy and I'm trying to get him to understand that his behaviors up until now are the reason why women don't find him attractive. It has a lot less to do with his looks than it does with his behaviors. The process of changing your behaviors is a catharsis. It's a major change. So when you reintroduce that girl that you have been you know, madly in love with for the first 10 years of your life and she's coming back into your life now, and you, you want to communicate to her, yeah, a lot has changed for me. Now, people go through catharsis all the time in their everyday development. Uh, the death of a parent can cause a major catharsis. Uh, the loss of a job. The loss of a, the loss of a, a limb or, or some major health issue. Any sense of major change will change the person such that they're not even the same person they were five, ten years ago. And I think every single person who, you know, from adolescence to adulthood to later adulthood into old age, our identities and the way we perceive ourselves are constantly changing. Well, this is the same type of catharsis. You need to communicate how you have changed and what uh, evoked or what uh, ignited that change. That's your catharsis story. That's one of the things you're going to communicate to the person who you've let back into your life to see if you can connect or not.
Wonderful. Well, we have actually come to the end of another show. Can you believe it? No, I can't. But every time we get on the phone together, it just it zooms by, <laughs> and this is this is like the fourth time I've been on, and we barely scratched the surface of all the things that we've always wanted to discuss. I know, I know. That's why I kept switching back and forth because I'm like, you know what? He's on the phone here. I got to ask him about this. I got to ask him about that. So um, the CD is from friends to lovers. Stop being her emotional cookie man. The website is franktalks.com. And uh, we're out of time, but thank you so much for being on, and I'm sure you'll be on again. <laughs> I would like that, and I look forward to it, Lucia. Okay, take care. Okay, take care. Bye. Bye. All right. Thank you so much for listening. I'm sure you learned a lot. That was a lot of information. Hopefully, we ha- we've helped some uh, guys to uh, become the nice guy with the edge, which is what women want. And uh, my website is theartoflove.net, where you can sign up for my weekly newsletter. My book is available at LessonsOfLove.net, and I am currently giving the book away for free to whoever signs up for one of my coaching programs, and you can find out about that on, of course, TheArtOfLove.net. And in the meantime, remember that love inspires, empowers, uplifts, and enlightens. You're listening to The Art of Love with your host, Lou Chia. Right here on L.A. Talk Radio. Need help with love, sex, dating, or relationship issues? Help from Frank Kermit the best-selling author and Canada's most international relationship coach is only a click away at franktalks.com franktalks.com